G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of eerie imagination. The fear you can hear. Vendetta. The very word itself invokes dread and strength mood of brooding terror. But to live on the island of Corsica, home of the Vendetta, is to be steeped in the tradition of violent massacres and the fatalistic expectation of ferocious vengeance as a way of life. At least it would have been so just a hundred years ago when these famous words were first written. It was a hand, a man's hand, not a skeleton hand all bright and clean, but a hand black and desiccated with the yellow nails, the naked muscles, and traces of blood upon the bones at the point where they had been severed as with the blow of an ax about the middle of the forearm. The fingers, extraordinarily long, were attached to enormous tendons, still held in their places here and there by strips of skin. That hand was something hideous. It made one think involuntarily of savage vengeance. And in spite of the putrescent look of death and dissolution, it seemed to have a life of its own. Our mystery drama, The Hand, was especially adapted from the Guy de Maupassant classic for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Alexander Scorby. I'll be back shortly with Act One. At the time of the bizarre and terrifying affair of the hand, Ari Donet was a police magistrate in Ayacho, a charming little white city nestled on the edge of a beautiful gulf shut in by lofty mountains. Most of the cases he had to investigate or prosecute there were cases of vendetta. But these were Corsican against Corsican. This affair of the hand was alien against what? Something far more alien, perhaps supernatural. That was not until later, of course. For now, the only alien presence was a neighbor of Henri's, a Sir John Rowell lately come to the island to settle down and an object of great speculation among the native population. Well, there goes my new neighbor again. <laughs> Does he go hunting at twilight? No, Bernard. At least as a magistrate, I hope not. Well, what's he shooting at then? I don't know, Marguerite. We have no sharks. The wolves and other predators stay in the mountains and uh, he's not been here long enough to start a vendetta. <laughs> Oh, I am not sure. Listen to that. Oh, no call for alarm, Doctor. I'm quite sure your services will not be needed. It is the same pattern, night and morning. Well, Henri, then what is he shooting at? A target, I suppose. He's keeping his eye sharp. But for what? Ah, now, that is the question. Have you seen him? He is immense and very powerful. And he doesn't encourage visitors. He has two huge Alsatian hounds that look ready for the kill at a word. You are chief magistrate and in a far better position to judge him than any Henri. What do you make of him? I don't know. His papers are in order. I have no reason to have any professional interest in him. Well, has he no one to share his loneliness? Mm, he has a manservant he brought with him from Marseille. Mm, no one else. There was a woman listed on the ship's manifest as his wife. Oh, his wife? Mm. Well, I never knew... Well, then, but no one seems to know that. In the months he's been here, no one has seen hide nor hair of her. I've watched these evenings myself, and I've never seen her move from the house. If, indeed, she is inside it. So you see, Marguerite, very soon, both as friend and policeman, I'm going to have to satisfy your curiosity, mm. and my own, about the mysterious Sir John Rowell. For a while, however, I had to content myself with having a close watch set over the man. None of my people could find anything suspicious enough in his actions for us to make any move. But as the strange rumors about him continued and increased, I resolved to see the stranger face to face for myself. 
I made a point of going hunting every day in the neighborhood of his place. It took me a little while, but at last, one day... So, Pierre Fernand, hold the point. You flushed him, ah! Got him right under the Englishman's nose. Go fetch him, Fernand. Fernand, hold! Hold him! Whiskey! Down, boy, down! That's it, good dog, hold! Here, Whiskey, here! My apologies, sir. Your bird, I believe? No, no, not at all. I shot him right from under you. Sorry. I didn't know you were there. <laughs> Nor I you. Uh, allow me. I'm John Rowell. Yes, I know, Sir John. I am your neighbor up there on the hill, Henri Donnet. Pleasure. Damn fine shot. Sir John, will you accept the game as an apology for shooting over your field? Uh, that's very generous. I'll accept on one condition. <laughs> What's that, Sir John? That you let me return the compliment and ask you to join me in a glass of ale. Good. I will be only too glad to accept. It was less the heat of the day than my professional interest that prompted me to accept the invitation from the tall man with the red hair and beard. Very tall indeed. And also very broad. A sort of placid and polite Hercules. I was most anxious to be able to question him about his life and his projects. Joseph, out here on the veranda. Uh, change your mind and have something stronger. Oh, no, 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 no. Ale will be perfect. Are you called, Sir John? Uh, yes, two glasses of ale for Monsieur Donnet and myself. Uh, very well, sir. And uh, bring a cut of Stilton and some water biscuits. Uh, you like our English cheeses? Oh, yes, I do. We are quite insular enough here on Corsica. It's a rare pleasure to indulge in a foreign taste. <laughs> I know what you mean. Still, I can't feel that Corsica, or for that matter, anything French is any way foreign to me. Ah, Joseph, splendid. Thank you. Uh, put the tray on the table here. Uh, yes, sir. You can loose the dogs again. We'll be quite safe while I'm with Monsieur Donnet. Very well, sir. Oh, those are the big Alsatians I see occasionally, huh? Mm, two of them. Yes, yes. They look quite uh, savage and fierce. Do you think perhaps my dog will... Oh, I have them? no fear. Castor and Pollux are as docile as kittens where other animals are concerned. They're trained as man-killers. Huh? And then, only at my command. Uh, your health, Monsieur Donnet? To yours. Mm. Delicious. So refreshing. Mm. As the view of the sun setting across that blue Mediterranean water. Yes, yes. Uh, does Madame Rowell also share your enthusiasm for your adopted island? Lady Rowell is uh, an invalid. I hope to nurse her back to health here. Oh, if I could suggest the offices of my good friend, Dr. Forestier. If a doctor should be needed. Oh, forgive me, I, I had no desire well, there's to There's nothing pry. to pry into. Natural curiosity. I must admit, I, I do find it hard to cast you in the category of a, a recluse. Oh, yes. I've traveled a great deal. Africa, India, even America. And as for adventures, yes, I've had plenty of adventures. Oh, yes. Big game hunting, huh? What? Oh, of course. I've hunted them all. Tiger, elephant, rhinoceros, gorilla... The name's a legion. Oh, all very dangerous animals. Terribly so. Not really. When you compare them to the worst of all. Oh, what? <laughs> what else, Monsieur Donnet? In your profession, you must know him too. Man. Oh. Man himself. Hey! Hey, Sir, Sir John, hey! Come quickly! What on earth? Hey! Hey, Sir John! Oh, forgive me. No, no, no. I followed Sir John down the front steps of the veranda as he took them two at a time and disappeared around the corner of the house. I would have followed him further, ex except as chance had it, I, I, I turned my ankle quite severely on a loose stone after the bottom step. Stopping in momentary pain, the yelp and snarl of the dog suddenly quieted, and I was conscious of the, the squeak of the front door of the house. Arrested, I looked up, to see, framed in the doorway, a tall, emaciated woman with great, bruised half-circles underlining her eyes that, that stared with a feverish gleam. She wore a long, loose, trailing peignoir, 
and with one hand, she beckoned towards me while clutching something in the other close beneath her breast. Painfully, I limped back up the steps. Help me. Whoever you are, help me. Lady Roll. Whoever I am, this side of the grave, help me. But how? By sending this letter. Oh, stay stop, please. Please, I beg of you on all our lives. Don't. Don't tell us such a... Oh, I'm afraid, madame, oh, I... Please, don't, don't refuse me. You are my last, best hope. Hope for what? I did not stay in case she returns, but please, I beg of you, send my letter. <laughs> as though she'd never been. But the letter in my hand was real enough. Before I had time to read the person to whom it was addressed, I found myself involuntarily concealing it in my pocket before Sir John returning could see it. Nor could I stop to ponder why my impulse had been to accept the lady's part rather than that of my charming and seemingly outgoing host. Why I chose to conceal its existence rather than reveal it. My dear Monsieur Donnet, pray forgive me. I'm most sorry we had to be interrupted. Oh, forgive me for not following you, but I turned my ankle. What happened? Oh, the curse of trying to maintain privacy. The curiosity seeker. A farmer from back in the hills named Deschamps, who passes by here on his daily route, for some unearthly reason came skulking round the back of the house and was cornered by the dogs. But uh, what would he have expected to find here? Heaven knows. I have no secrets worth anyone's concern but my own, uh, as I hope you believe. Or is your presence here today more than just a seeming accident? Are you concealing something from me, sir? For the first time, I was aware that he wore about his loins an American-style gun belt, and that low on each hip, concealed by the flare of his coattails, were two matched pistols with mother-of-pearl handles, on one of which his right hand rested lightly. The letter in my pocket seemed to burn through the lining as I tried to judge whether it caressed that handle by accident or design. These were only the hands of Sir John, neither of which is the one in the title of our story. To meet that special hand, you must return with me shortly for Act Two. <coughs> towers over the small, dapper Frenchman. They are as widely disparate men as you can imagine. One all muscle and vital force, the other elastic, supple, poised always for the counterstroke, like a rapier. Antagonists? No, only in a sense. But whatever their relationship, mutually admiring of each other. Why should you imagine I have anything to conceal? Why, indeed. Come, let's go inside. I'll show you some of the trophies of a roving life, uh, if you'd be interested. But very, of course. Uh, can you stand on your ankle all right? Is it uh, sprained? No, 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 just a slight twist. From the hall, he led me into his parlor, which ran the length and breadth of the whole house across the back in a great L. His parlor was all hung in black, black silk, embroidered in gold. The fabric is Japanese work. Yes, yes, but... But the rest is yours. Uh, not the panels. What's mounted on them? Yes, tiger, lion, black panther. Those I recognize. And elephant tusks, I see. Uh, the hippo and he and the rhino are a little large for mounting. The rhinoceros is the most dangerous of all, I suppose. Except... As I told you before. <laughs> now, you're not honestly going to tell a policeman that you're a manhunter. <laughs> not within the confines of civilization, I hope. But I've uh, done a good deal of manhunting, too, in my time. Uh, as a soldier? 
that's a profession, not a sport. I've saved a mount in the center for the ultimate trophy, but uh, never had, shall we say, the courage to make the necessary bag to mount it. I was following the direction of his gaze to a gapingly empty panel in this bizarre and gory collection from the hunt. A panel conspicuous from all the others since it was lined in red velvet as if in expectance of framing the pièce de résistance. What would you hope to put there? Once, I would have been tempted. Now, nothing. I keep it there to remind me that it could be my own head that poetic justice could have easily decided to frame. Oh, God, it's suddenly getting dark. Yes, then I must be off for home. I mustn't hold up your dinner. I've enjoyed our meeting thoroughly. Please, come again. You're always welcome. Well, I am not quite so sure of your Alsatians. Oh, you need have no worry. From now on, they'll treat you as a friend. As I hope I can. As I want to be. We shook hands. Mine disappearing inside his huge one. My conscience stinging at me as I fought a battle between Donet the man and... Donay, the policeman. Climbing the hill back to my villa with Fernand frisking along beside me, I tried to tell myself I was only being practical, that I was giving myself time to make my decision. A decision that was tipped by the testimony I received from Michel Deschamps as I questioned him at the barracks the following morning. Michel, why did you go so near to his house? Well, everybody is curious about him, and... Everybody doesn't go near enough to have two dogs attack him. Well, everybody does not have a milk coat which takes him twice a day by the Englishman's house to see her. What, to see her? Well, it is at dawn, you know. Just before the sun comes up in the half-light and I am passing by in my car. Well, naturally, I, I'm looking at the house when I pass. Naturally, I would myself. So, you see, at that hour, nobody is stirring. Even the dogs are not yet awake. And then I see by the upstairs window a woman. The first few days, I'm not sure. I, I cross myself she is not some witch or somebody who wants to steal my soul. Why would she be a witch? Because... Well, at any rate, in that light, she looked so... I, I was afraid to answer. Mm, to answer what? Her signal to come near to her. She kept beckoning as if there was something she must ask me to do. Uh, finally, yesterday morning, I, I could stand it no longer. I had to go see what she wanted to ask. W was that so wrong? No, of course not, Michel. I would have done the same. But the dogs stopped you, huh? Y yes. In a way, I, I'm sorry. Don't feel that you let her down. But from now on, mind your own business. Oh, I, I accept your instruction. I, I will follow what you advocate. What I advocate, by all means. Not what I do. I, I, I don't understand you. Sometimes, even a magistrate has to admit... I do not understand myself. But that is not for you to worry about. That very morning, there was a mail packet sailing. And I sent off the letter, quickly, almost surreptitiously, without looking at the address, except for the fact that it was to the United States of America. And I forgot it, I imagined. And the months went by. I do think it's very tedious of you, Henri. <laughs> Madame Forestier. Oh, well, either for reasons of your own, you are protecting our most famous visitor from the rest of us, or, well, <laughs> he has some hold over you to protect his precious privacy. <laughs> he has no hold over me. Oh. Quite the contrary. 
But if he wishes to be private, I would be the first to protect his right. But on, on a small island like this, why should he have it any more than the rest of us? <laughs> Touché. But if he can, why shouldn't he? Oh, huh? Henri, you know I don't know how to answer that. All I want to know is, do I have any hope that they might attend my garden set next month? They? Well, there is a Madame Roel. Yes. But she is uh, sickly. Ah, ah, well, is there some hope that at least uh, Sir John might be coaxed to appear? No, I have no reason <laughs> to suppose that he would refuse. Now, Lady Roll, I would find it hard to answer for. Well, then, all I want for you is to issue the invitation. Please, may I count on you for that? Marguerite. <laughs> We're all old friends. Did you ask? <laughs> my doubts about Sir John, and more particularly his lady, attending any local garden fete. But I could scarcely, in my wildest imaginings, have foreseen how extravagantly and tragically it would be impossible. As I approached the house in the hollow below me, I was in a first-class mood, because in addition to a packet from the mail ship for my host, I also bought a bottle of sherry to share with him that, in my opinion, was one of a kind. He met me at the veranda. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure. We had a mail ship in today. I brought you a parcel. Me? Yes. And I thought I'd outstrip the mail. Vain hope. A parcel, you say? Mm. Yes. Oh, what on earth? It might be a gun from its shape, but it scarcely weighs enough. Uh, shall we go to the parlor while I open my surprise parcel? <laughs> As we moved into that parlor, I was super conscious of my host's reaction to the parcel he bore in his hands. Although there was no sea prescription from the sender, I had an infallible feeling that he sensed exactly where it had come from. That somehow I was accidentally part of a climax in the life of this strange and vital man. You've talked about my trophies, Monsieur Donnet. Yes. The ones I've mounted, the others too clumsy and large to render that way. Yes. And the third and different class, so far I've had no right nor courage to mount. What are you saying, Sir John? There is no reason for my receiving this parcel that I can conceive, except one. That I've found no refuge here. I've been betrayed. Only my wife could have done that. And who else is there to have aided her determination to destroy me? You're asking me? Yes. You're the only link we have to the world beyond this house. Sir John, I... Believe me, I had no wish to betray you. I'm sure of that. The day we met, your wife, while you were calming the dogs, your wife asked me to send a letter for her. To Richard Roll? Well, I must admit I did not read the address. I did notice that it was to the United States of America. I meant no harm. He meant no harm. Like Pandora, who naively opened a chest to loose pestilence and all the evils of the world to plague mankind, he meant no harm. It seemed a simple and reasonable request. So you exceeded. No doubt she also asked you to conceal the facts of the letter from me. Yes, I am afraid she did. Were you sorry for her ravaged looks, her haunted eyes? Did you picture me as some monstrous jailer, condemning her to a life of solitary confinement? Sir John, I can only defend my action by telling you that at the time she did engage my sympathy. I told you, I believe, that my wife was not in the best of health. Yes, but to... her fault perhaps was all mine. I should have told you that she is insane. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. A little late for that. Done. You may have sealed her death warrant. Perhaps even mine. Good God, what, what do you mean? This parcel from America. Would you like to see what evil out of hell you're acceding to that simple and reasonable request has set loose? Sir John, you I... have involved yourself in this on a personal level. Now I want to involve you on a professional one. As police magistrate, I want you as witness when I open this gift from America. The outer wrapping. Now what do you see? A box. And 
within it. Something wrapped in, in canvas. You wrinkle your nose against the smell? Yes, it's, it's very strong. And uh, very familiar? Yes, formaldehyde. Which is used to preserve flesh from mortifying. There's a drawstring on the canvas, which I'm opening. And I'm about to show you my presence from the other side of the world. You sound as if you know what it is. I only wish to God I thought I didn't. I echoed the same wish. But it didn't change the contents. It was a hand. A man's hand. Not a skeleton hand all bright and clean. But a hand black and desiccated. With traces of blood upon the bones at the point where they had been severed as with the blow of an axe about the middle of the forearm. The fingers, extraordinarily long, were attached to enormous tendons still held in their places by strips of skin. Flayed as it was, that, that hand was something hideous. It made one think involuntarily of savage vengeance. And in spite of the putrescent look of death and dissolution it had, it seemed to have a life of its own. So now we see the embodiment of the title of our story. A poor choice of words, since nothing can be more disembodied than a severed hand. Whose hand? And why? And are these nerveless fingers really capable of writing a death warrant? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Journeying with revulsion, Monsieur Denet looks at the loathsome object spilled on the desk between him and Sir John. In macabre fascination, his eyes seem riveted to the severed hand. It is only by a supreme effort of will that he is at last able to drag them away and up to Sir John's grim and haunted face. What is it? The hand of a thief. But why? What? Why is it sent to you? So that there'll be no mistake in my mind who sends it. You said before, Richard Roll. A relation? My twin brother. Younger by less than an hour. As the firstborn, I acceded to the title. The barony was mine, and the living that went with it. Richard had nothing except my bounty. Our whole life was a gigantic struggle to supremacy. He, because I denied it him, I... Because I had to hold it. If you had everything and he had nothing, what chance did he stand against you? Well, I'm English, and I believe in fair play. I couldn't share the title, but I made sure the living was shared equally. I'm not ill-favored, and I'm exceptionally powerful and large. But Richard was taller by two inches, stronger by far, and a wild and darkly handsome man that stirred women to a passion beyond their senses. Until Claire. Madame Rohl? My wife, yes. Whatever her true name should be now. When we were married, my brother Richard emigrated to the States. And you have never seen him since? Oh, yes, I have seen him. I'd hoped for the last time. Will you forgive me now? There's been too much talk. But I must find a place to hang my latest trophy. Oh, to hang it? You can't do I think I've had quite enough interference from you in my affairs, Monsieur Donnet. I must ask you to leave my house. You're no longer welcome. It seemed a long journey up the hill that night. For I did not climb it alone. On the way back to my house, I was haunted by a hundred thoughts. Had I done wrong to send the letter? Whose was the severed hand? What was the mystery of Sir John's retirement? And what motivated the vendetta of his brother against him? 
old jealousies? Or was it all as simple as chercher la femme? Certainly, she would not be hard to find. It must be the lady role, if a woman was at the heart of it all. Only one thing I could be sure of now, that I should not be seeing him again. But I was badly mistaken about that. Well, Joseph, what brings you here? Uh, begging your honor's pardon, but Sir John asks if it would be convenient for you to wait on him this evening. Of course, when? If it would suit your honor, now it would be fine. It suits me. After my churlishness on your last visit, I am more than touched that you do me this honor, Monsieur Dunay. Since I am still concerned that I may have done you more harm than honor, I couldn't have hesitated. I have some papers here on my desk that I wish to leave in your charge, after asking you and Joseph to witness them. What kind of papers, Sir John? My last will and testament, some property assignments, the legal debris that follows sudden death. Uh, Joseph? Hey, Sir John. Will you sign here uh, and here? Uh, yes, sir. Is there all this immediacy, sir? In the midst of life, are we not all equally in the midst of death? Uh, thank you, Joseph. You may go. Uh, yes, sir, John. Now, you, Monsieur Donnet. If you want me to. But I see no reason why. Whatever polite disclaimer was on my lips, it was frozen at that moment as my eyes fell on a blood-chilling sight. A black object in the midst of the empty panel lined with red velvet, empty no longer. It was the hand, mounted now as the chief of all trophies. But different from all the others in one respect, they were mounted. This was imprisoned. Round the wrist, an enormous chain of iron had been riven about the foul relic, and this chain fastened the hand of the wall by a great ring, solid enough to hold an elephant in leash. Good God! Ah, yes, the hand. Well, better than my own head, if I can keep it. Will you sign? Well, yes, of course. Is it? That hand? That was part of my best enemy. It was cut off for the saber. Good thing for me, I can tell you. It's huge. Enormously powerful. The man must have been very strong. And so far, I've proved stronger. I put the chain on the hand to hold it. The chain is no use now. The hand can't get away. The chain is necessary. This hand always tries to get away. That night, I had a hideous nightmare. I dreamt I saw the hand, the horrible hand, running like a scorpion or a spider along the curtains and up and down the walls of my room. Three times I woke up, three times I went to sleep again. Three times I saw the ghastly thing running all over my room and using its fingers like so many legs. The next morning, I was awakened by the news that Sir John Rowell had been murdered during the night. For God's sake, Bernard, act like a doctor instead of some frightened schoolgirl. No, you... You have not seen him yet, old friend. Well, is it the first corpse either of us has had the misfortune to look at? The first like this. Oh, how did he die? The cause of death was strangling, but under what shocking conditions. I tell you, Henri, in 30 years as a physician, I have never seen anything like him. In what way? We found him lying on his back in the middle of the room. His coat was torn, one shirt sleeve half pulled off was hanging down. There was every indication that a fearsome struggle had taken place. 
His face was black and swollen, frightfully distorted. But the most noticeable and terrifying thing was his expression. His expression? Absolute, hideous fear. And small wonder. For in the welter of blood that was coagulated about his throat, five separate wounds pierced through it as though driven by points of iron. Only five? It was as if he had been strangled by a skeleton. Well, that is odd. What? What you just said. Hmm? Only five. Well, of course, how stupid of me. There was only evidence of one hand having done the strangling. That makes it even more bizarre. Is there anything even faintly normal about this whole affair? Now, Joseph, you heard no unusual noise during the night. Oh, no, Monsieur the Magistrate. You sleep where? Well, here in that, that little room off the kitchen there. And there was no sound from the dogs all night long? Oh, no, sir. Yet, if a stranger had approached the house... Oh, those dogs would have torn him apart if, if he was a stranger. But they were quiet. You would have heard them if they had not been, huh? Well, I'm a very light sleeper. Yeah. Did you sleep late this morning? No, no. I'm awake before cocks crow, you see. So many things to be done. Water to be drawn, the fire to yeah, be yeah, made. Yes. And that's what you were busy with when Lady Rowell left the house? Yes, I, I was already preparing breakfast for Sir John and a tray to bring up to... You see, that's why I was so surprised when she walked into the kitchen fully dressed. And what did you say to that? Well, it's not my place to ask. I, I, I just said, what do you want? And, and? Well, she said she she didn't want anything. Just that she was feeling better. And if Sir John should ask about her, she was off for a little walk along the beach. Oh, that didn't strike you as peculiar? Oh, it most certainly did. And did she go towards the beach? Well, I would have thought so. I didn't actually check on it. Why? You're not aware that... But she's disappeared. Did she? Oh, no, sir. Oh, we'll leave that for a moment. All right, then what did you do then? Well, once I had everything simmering like for breakfast, I went up to Sir John's room to assist him in his toilet. You were in this habit? Every morning, regular as clockwork. Continue. Well, he wasn't there, sir. His bed hadn't been slept in. Turned down just the way I left it the night before. So I became alarmed. Everything was out of sorts, you see. I see. And and then you came downstairs and found him. That's right. Oh, covered with blood from head to foot. It, it just don't signify. Now, what does that mean? Well, you knew, Sir John, sir. If ever there was a man built and ready to take care of himself, it was he. Why, he never slept without having loaded pistols or revolvers within arm's reach. And he knew how to use them. Yes, yes. Have you any idea who killed him? Oh, no, sir. Could it have been Lady Rowe? Not a chance, sir. I met her once. She was a tall woman. Oh, but wasted away, Your Honor, and weak as a kitten. Then who? I don't know, sir. I, I don't even want to know. <laughs> to die, or at least to check on what was in my mind. But I had a duty to my position, and I must admit a morbid drive to support my supposition. He was lying, just as he is now, on this carpet here? That's right, sir. His feet pointed in the same direction? Uh, toward the door. And uh, his head? As it is, sir. Holds the panel directly ahead of you. I felt a, a creeping sensation that lifted the hackles on my neck. I knew, before I looked, what I was going to say. The sight that I had fought against making a reality. At last, involuntarily, I lifted my eyes to the wall, to the panel where the horrible flayed hand used to be. No longer there. The chain, broken, was dangling from the ring. But even that horror was to be succeeded by another. As I bent again over the dead man, 
Between his clenched teeth, I found one of the fingers of the vanished hand, severed or rather sawed off by the teeth about the middle of the second joint. Sorry. Forgive us for violating the sacred precincts of your police office, but the axle of my carriage is broken and we are here to beg you to carry us home. If you are ready to go. I'm always at your service. And tonight, since it grows dark early these evenings, I will welcome company. But surely you're, you're not still brooding over Sir John and his vanished lady? The missing lady role I can accept. Our gulf is beautiful, but the tides are treacherous, and her hold on life at best was tenuous. Perhaps she wanted to end it. The mystery of Sir John is something else again. Uh, something best forgotten, I think. Yes. But it doesn't seem to want to be. Let me show you. Marguerite, forgive me. If you feel faint... Close your eyes. Yes. Bernard, you remember you said he might have been strangled by a skeleton? Yes. Yeah. Might he have been strangled by this? <gasps> Good Lord. <laughs> so that is the famous hound, huh? Yes, yes, if it were possible, such a hound could have made the wounds on his throat, but... Where did you find this? It was discovered last night in the cemetery on the tomb of Sir John Rawl. And mark one thing well. What? The index finger is missing. <gasps> the one we found in the corpse's mouth. <laughs> The hand of a thief, Sir John Rawl said. His brother Richard? What is so? What did he steal? His wealth? His reputation? His wife? And if his brother, in some gargantuan and titanic duel, struck off his hand, and Richard sought vengeance, which of his hands was the instrument that brought an end to the intense and private vendetta? De Maupassant doesn't tell us. Wisely, he leaves that to us to decide for ourselves. I'll be back shortly. I won't easily close my eyes tonight for fear that my mind's eye will conjure up a vision of the black and desiccated hand with the yellow nails scrabbling like some loathsome crab across the floor, up and over my bed, and scuttling around the walls. It's four good fingers moving like spider legs, the mutilated stump of the fifth like a head. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Ian Martin, Mildred Clinton, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You will be haunted by the magnet that drew you to me. The weapon with which I ruined your life and will destroy you. My smile, Ernest. My smile. No. Look at me. Sensuous lips bearing milk white. Perfectly matched teeth. Look. Oh, oh, she's me. falling across the table. I think. Yes. She's gone. Berenice is dead. No. Ernest, don't. Her mouth. She is staring at me with her teeth. Anthony. In heaven's name, close her mouth. Close her mouth! This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>